And just keep on going to this side, please. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Kendra Castaldo, Director of Healthcare Transformation and Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities. Okay. Kendra, you changed your name. Oh, I did, did I? <laughs> So we have a few people on the line. Uh, would you like to introduce yourselves? Uh, Rich Meadows, I'm the CEO for the Medical Group Catholic. For those of you who are on the line, if you wouldn't mind muting uh, when you're not speaking, that will, uh, I think, help with the feedback. Okay, next. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mark. Mark Wakai, probably St. Joseph Health with Catholic and St. Mary. Hi, Mark. Hi. Carlos Correa from Australia Health Center from Sunnyside. Okay. Joyce Neeson with 211. Beth Thornbrook, Comprehensive Healthcare. All right. Mo Molly Shue, Prosser Memorial Health. All right. Kevin Martin, Kittitas Valley Health. Valley Health. Hello, Kevin. Manny Olson, Beth Thornbrook, Community Health. Okay. Better back up on that one. Um, could you try again? <laughs> Let's. So it's Mandy Olson and Kurt Williamson. Yeah. Yeah, Mandy Olson at Kennetown Valley Healthcare. Okay, Mandy. Megan DeBolt, Walla Walla, Walla County. Hello, Megan. Teresa Quaid. Let's take Teresa first. Who was that? Teresa Quaite from Palouse Medical, and then we have T.J. Osborne from Palouse Medical and Kim Nigreen from Palouse Medical. 
Okay, welcome. Deb Watson, Pullman Regional Hospital. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth Hillman, Pullman Regional Hospital. Great, great. Dave Wilson, Merit Resource Services. All right, Dave. Marcia Baden, Garfield County Hospital. Catch that. Who was it? Could you repeat that, please? Hello. Marcia Baden, Garfield County Hospital. Marcia. All right. Franklin Health District. Health District. Health District. Health District. Okay. Anybody Good morning, else? Ms. Sherry. Sherry. From Amerigroup, and I think it's echoing because people have the uh, audio on and they're dialing in, possibly. Uh, good morning. Yeah. Okay, Sherry, sure. thank you. We're getting a cleaner sound now, so something must have changed. Anybody else? We've got 21 of you on the line. Brian Land, Health System. Could you start again? Was that Brian? Brian Lance, uh, the Community Based Memorial. Okay, great. And Dan Ferguson, the Nally Health Center of Excellence. Hello, Dan. Morning. Morning. Lindsay Ng with the Health Center. Wendy. Lindsay. Lindsay. Lindsay, got it. Is that it? I saw Ed Thornburg uh, name up there. Are you on, Ed? Uh, yeah, I was in the early group. <laughs> Ed Thornburg, Comprehensive Healthcare. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay, so uh, that's a pretty big turnout today. And um, let us know if you're unable to follow the, um, the slides, but it should be pretty straightforward with our pres presenters. Um, and I'm going to turn it over now to Wes, who's going to, uh, it's not on your agenda, but just give you a, a bit of a uh, snapshot of where we are in the ACH with our process. That came out of some of the feedback about what the ACH could do better operationally, is to keep you informed about this rather complicated uh, timeline that we're all on to the end of 2021. So, Wes? So as you can see here in this um, project management flow diagram, this is our work plan for just 2019, which began in February. Um, we don't have January up here. The top line um, relates to, in part, what you're about to go through today. This is a learning collaborative that focuses on the exemplar organizations for bidirectional integration. Going forward next month, we will also have another learning collaborative slash leadership council that relates to EMS and community paramedicine. And continuing on that top horizontal line, there will be further learning collaboratives throughout the year that will focus on the prescription monitoring database, medication management, QI, access, continuity, and other important aspects of practice transformation in the patient-centered medical home. The horizontal line below that, um, which also relates to uh, practice transformation, relates to the flow of the organizations, your organizations, that are going through this process right now. Um, as you all probably know, at the end of this month, your first quarterly milestone reporting deliverables will be coming due. We're working on a reporting platform um, for that through CSI, which we've talked about in the past. If that process is not complete in time, we do have a backup. Many of you received either an electronic or a paper version of our workbook, which is a translation of the toolkit. So in one form or another, there will be um, a method for you to report on your milestone deliverables. So that repeats at a quarterly cadence. So at the end of March, at the end of June, the end of September, the end of December, those reporting deliverables will be due. The subsequent following month for each of those months, the practice transformation work group, our key strategy group, will be getting together to review the cumulative results to monitor progress. So, Again, in that second horizontal line, <clears throat> you'll see, it, it's a little hard to see, but you see C1, C2, 
in front of those. C1 relates to the first cohort, which is a practice transformation organizations here today going through this process. The second cohort is still in a tentative planning phase. Um, we've gone through some financial modeling with the help of OHSU to understand what the cost of bringing in some additional organizations through this very important process will be like. We have not chosen organizations specifically yet. If we do, they will have to go through the LOI CSA process. They will have to be contracted. They'll go through the budgetary process. All the things that you went through to get here where you are, where you are today. So if that happens, then um, they would uh, possibly begin their process at the midpoint of this year. Below that, we have our Medicaid transformation projects. The two main projects that are separate from practice transformation include uh, the opioid project and transitional care. Uh, Diane Halo, who's our opioid resource network manager, has been working incredibly hard. We just came back from Yakima yesterday where we met with PNWU, Catholic Charities. Um, we had a great meeting. The summit is going to be tremendous. There's going to be hundreds of people there. Um, the speakers that we've lined up are really world class. It's going to be a really great summit. So the planning for that is a big part of the opioid project flow. The other big part of that is the RFP that's in play right now for a network manager for the opioid resource network in the Tri-Cities in Walla Walla. That RFP will be due at the uh, during this month. Subsequent to that, there will be a, it's due tomorrow. So subsequent to that, I didn't realize it was that quick. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. So um, we may be actually sending out reminders. I said not reminders. Okay. So we have reminders to organizations who may know, who may want to participate in that, and those are practice transformation organizations who can participate. So once the RFPs come back, um, there'll be an external um, third party who reviews those. Um, then there'll be a selection. Um, the contract will be awarded. We'll go through the contracting phase, uh, concomitant with that, simultaneously or concurrent with that. <clears throat> we also hope to organize another health commons, similar to what we've been doing in Kittitas. So um, we believe in the health commons. The work that's played out has looked really well so far, and it's just a natural fit with the Opioid Resource Network that we hope to have in Walla Walla and Tri-Cities. So that plays out through that. You'll see that. I don't have a pointer. Do we have a pointer? It's a, it's a little hard to see. So this is the that's yeah, that's the opioid project flow we just talked about. Um, for transitional care, the, the one point that's on here right now relates to a summit that we hope to put together. Um, Sam um, and her group are working on this as well, and this will also cross over into practice transformation. But we also hope to um, to have a separate summit for that. Um, below that, you can see these um, HIT projects. I won't go into a lot of detail here. You can see the Health Commons, the CSI platform. Um, All Payers Claims Database is a contract we have with King County to report on some deliverables. At some point, we hope to bring you some information about the APCD. It's a potentially great resource. Um, direct Secure Messaging, the Consumer Resource Directory, there's more to come about that. Lauren has been doing a lot of analysis related to that. Um, and then pre-managed and Eddie. So there's a lot of streams related to HIT. Um, beneath that, we have some um, miscellaneous projects. Uh, just this week, we had a tremendous housing summit in the Tri-Cities for Benton and Franklin counties. There were more than 90, 90 participants in that summit. Um, that was part of that flow right there. That will actually be extended out with additional work as that proceeds forward. That, event, that eventually may end up in the creation um, of a supportive housing complex in the Tri-Cities. That would be tremendous. Beneath that is the ACES campaign. Um, that's the process that Ruben is overseeing and managing. Um, the task force has met. They had a meeting uh, last week. Um, and we're going through the process of the subsequent stages here. That uh, project is a little bit in, in flux right now, depending on what the task force sees as um, how the project should be uh, put together in terms of the program, the programming. Beneath that, um, there's the Lynn Workforce 
flow, um, and there's more to come through that. Carol is, is tied into that, and we'll be hearing more about that as well. And then here are a couple board retreats. We have a sustainability planning retreat that will be happening in April, and then there will be a cultural sensitivity training that works with the Yakima Nation that will be happening in September. This bottom part of the diagram <clears throat> doesn't relate to uh, projects underway, it relates to our reporting and the um, subsequent reimbursement that comes with reporting. So our 3.0, the semi-annual report, will be due at the end of um, July. Tied to that will be the very first paper reporting um, that we'll be, we'll be giving to healthcare authority. So here, we've estimated that through the implementation plan, SAR 2.0, which was turned in at the end of January, integrated managed care funds. Um, we've estimated potentially $17.5 million will be coming in for incentive payments. And then at the end of the year um, for SAR 3.0 and then paper reporting, we estimate another $5.6 million. Okay. Right. So, clarification, rather than the end of March, <clears throat> it will be due at the midpoint of April, April 15th, the deadline. Thank you very much. My mistake. Any other questions? That was just a quick run through. We'll make this available. Um, it will be posted on the website, but we'll include it with the uh, materials for the day. And if you have specific questions, you'd like to talk to us offline, come and see Carol, myself, the Practice Transformation Navigators, Diane, whoever you'd like to talk to. Okay, so uh, I just have one item to touch on under uh, my entry under Community Trends. And if you recall, for those of you who, are last, who were here in February, uh, I was asked to give an overview of some of the social, and I'm going to call them social economic determinants of health. And this is something Ruben's been working on a lot with the lens. And I think I was able to get through about four of these. So I thought I'd just share one more with you today and uh, use uh, the, the projects we have underway in a couple of our communities uh, that we have uh, so-called trends projects. And uh, the indicator I'd just like to talk about is housing appropriately, since we just had the housing summit on Tuesday. And uh, this is looking at the renters of our uh, Greater Columbia ACDH, and in particular looking at a measure that, that, uh, that uh, gives, I think, a pretty good idea of extreme stress in renting. So many of you, I think, are aware that there's a 30% threshold uh, looking at rental income, and that basically says renters to match or to be able to meet all their other obligations in daily living uh, shouldn't spend more than 30% of their household income on shelter costs, which is largely rent and utilities. So uh, I'm not gonna show you those, those numbers. Uh, we've learned, if you don't know this already, that, that that is actually quite high in many communities. It's very often 30 to 40, sometimes even higher than 40%. Of, of our rental community that pays that much of their income in, in rent. What I'd like to do today instead is focus on the severely rent burdened households in our, in our midst. So uh, we have data directly for Yakima County and for the two counties here, Benton and Franklin County. And I just wanted to show this recent trend to you. And if you could X out all the lines in that graph, Warren, except uh, Yakima County. That would be great. No, no, just go down. There you go. Get the legend. Yeah. Just keep. Okay. So uh, if you mouse over 2017, uh, just the bar. So we have in in the county of Yakima 6,400 people in that in that situation. Uh, and as a rate, why don't you click on the rate, uh, the second line down? Uh, in the legend. There you go. And now serve that again. So 20% of all renter households in Yakima County spend that much of their income on shelter costs. So 
just put yourself in those people's shoes and imagine how that might work in trying to meet other obligations. How does that compare then in Yakima to the state of Washington? Why don't you click on the next item in the legend? Actually, not, not as perhaps as, as uh, dire as you might think. Uh, the state of Washington actually has slightly higher rates. Now click that off and put the put the U.S. up and get rid of uh, get rid of Washington State. And you can see that the U.S. has actually got a little higher rate. So this is a wonderful thing for me about data is that it it maybe pops a little bit of a balloon and maybe those of you in Yakima think that we're worse off than the state we're worse off than the U.S. Well, this is census data. They're pretty good about taking their surveys. I mean, they're close, but you're 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 not too not too different from uh, from the U.S. So let's go on then to um, Benton and Franklin counties. Okay, so mouse over if you wouldn't mind. So uh, similar number. And the rate, if you can put that up there. So the rate, very similar rate, 20%. And if you recall what it was like, now put, please put uh, Washington State up. Uh, pretty, pretty close to the state of Washington. And then uh, take that off and put up the uh, United States. And as you can see, uh, actually a little bit lower than, than, than the U.S. as well. So. All this to say is that we, we, we all are confronted with affordable housing issues in our communities, but one of the takeaways from this is so is everybody else. <laughs> uh, this is just an endemic feature of our society right now for, for lots of reasons. Now, we have other projects, and I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to touch on, show you, uh, show you what the graphs look like, but I'll just read off similar results for 2017. Uh, for Walla Walla County, it's actually higher. May surprise you the the number of uh, the percentage of renters in this precarious position is almost a quarter, 24 percent. Yet you go into uh, Southeast Washington, Osoten County, uh, Columbia County, it's in the mid-teens. So I don't know how we interpret that, but 15 or 16 percent. Garfield County, actually quite high, 26%, which I, I, I don't know even how many rental units we have in Garfield County, but there's some. <laughs> and then finally, and I, I, I apologize for those of you on the line from Whitman County, I didn't put this in, I, I omitted Whitman County. But I, I would imagine this is similar uh, to the results I'm about to show you. Kittitas County, of all the parts of our ACH, actually has the highest the highest uh, percentage of those who are facing extreme housing. Uh, it's over 30%. And I, Kevin uh, Martin, I think, brought this up at our last meeting. Some of this is undoubtedly related to students. And I, I would imagine this is true in, in, in Whitman County, too, is that you know, we have to be careful with our measurements here. If, if you've got students living in that situation, it's a little different than somebody who's 50 years old living in that situation. Because we, we hope, if we believe in higher education, that they're not going to, those students are not going to be in the situation too long. But for the, for the major uh, population centers, which are basically Yakima and the Tri-Cities, you can see that we're not that different and actually a little bit better than the, the benchmarks that we typically use for extremely uh, challenged uh, renters. So I'll just leave it at that. If you guys have questions, we can talk about that. Rhonda is going to be giving you a, uh, uh, I think, a, a really interesting look at uh, some housing experiences in, uh, in Yakima that might relate a little bit to this. So now I'd like to bring Sam to the fore and introduce our speakers. And uh, maybe while she's doing that, uh, Brian, you want to, you're, you're first, right? You want to you want to come up? Yeah. And um, so, welcome to the first learning collaborative of the uh, leadership council. And Sam's going to walk you through the rest of the day. Hi, I'm Sam Wardell. 
good morning. And with, there's a lot of familiar places or faces here. Um, I have been asked to give a group introduction for our speakers, which we're so excited to have. Or in my case, I guess a short introduction, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is Brian Sandoval. He comes from Yakima Valley Farm Workers. I've had the pleasure of working with Brian for a couple of years now. I've also had the opportunity to be able to go out and shadow one of his clinics, actually two now. And um, he has been very instrumental in helping us with our project teams as well as um, many, many, many speaking engagements. So I would like to welcome Brian. So Sam, please, you can you explain why we're doing these things at the Oh, yes, yes. Not all of them are simpler. Right. Right. So, Today we're going to talk about integration of different aspects of healthcare into our primary care setting, as well as behavioral health, pharmaceutical. Um, Brian has been an expert in bi-directional for Yakima Valley Farm Workers. They were early adopters, and they have integrated many of their clinics and been very successful. All right. So thanks for having me. Um, I know that I've given a couple different presentations here, and I, I think I'm going to do this a little bit more TED style, a little more. Um, I know, I know there's a lot of data, and we can just go forward and keep going and keep going. And I know you're going to see tons of data. I thought this would be a little bit more of a conversation style, and then uh, I wanted to save some time at the end to have a little bit more discussion um, because, again, I think I think we can look at a lot of data points, and at the end of the day, walk away like, okay, what do I do with that? Um, so let's. So I, I purposely have a couple slides of content and then not a lot of content um, and more of a discussion. All right. So we'll go with the first one. Uh, oh, I guess I have the clicker. Um, so it's, I guess we should start by saying um, bidirectional integration is, I really don't like the term bidirectional integration because I think it's just a more of a system integration issue. Um, if we really think about what the toolkit is and what we're tasked to do is find a way to integrate these models of care that, um, and we're going to go through the models here in a second, um, but you've got, I think a lot of you are familiar with collaborative care, uh, the Breed Collaborative allows a lot of flexibility and integration. Um, and then we have Behavioral Health Homes, which is uh, a, a really cool way to, to make sure that we're taking care of uh, our more significantly mentally ill patients or patients that just are already engaged uh, in, a, in a behavioral health center. Uh, and then we have offsite collaboration, which I kind of think is more of a system integration. Um, and so these things are all supposed to come together um, in the context of the resources that are out there in the community. So it's multi-directional integration, I think is a better way to describe it. So let's talk a little bit about what these models mean. And this will provide some context for more of the conversation. I promise there's not too many of these content slides. Um, but you've got, you basically have, I mean, all of these models, you've got apples, oranges, and grapes. Um, they used to be apples and oranges. I added grapes uh, last night. Um, so, I mean, there really are different fruit, and they all kind of do different things. Um, so, primary care behavioral health, or you'll see is PCBH, um, the apple there. Um, is really what we consider kind of an operationalizing of the breed collaborative elements. Primary care behavioral health for those folks that um, have heard this before, it's more of the consultation, the warm handoff model. Um, so, and then you've got collaborative care, which I know you, a lot of you are already all familiar with, um, and then behavioral health homes, which is um, integrating uh, primary care into a behavioral health setting. So let's talk a little bit about kind of the functions of these models um, and then talk a little bit about the evidence base for those models and what, what we can do with that information. So the first thing is primary care behavioral health, the consultation model, is really about what we call horizontal integration. Horizontal integration, when I mean that is the idea is to um, reach a very large subset of the population. So it's, it's expansive, horizontal meaning outward, right? So uh, take all comers, um, you know, at the time of care. Um, that's really what, what uh, primary care behavior health is. Collaborative care, on the other hand, is more of a vertical integration model, right? Collaborative care is focused on working through a specific identified disease state. So it could be depression, it could be diabetes, it could be um, generalized anxiety. Uh, we're really seeing a lot of cool things come through with collaborative care for MAT, um, which I think is a great direction for collaborative care to go. 
Um, so it's, it's focused on one specific subpopulation and doing a great job at both identifying that population and then measuring success over time. Behavioral health homes, on the other hand, I also see as a little bit more um, as a horizontal integration because when you're integrating primary care into a behavioral health home, you're trying to expand primary care access, right, for a large subset of people that otherwise may not get it. Um, so you're really, it's a horizontal integration of, of, of the medical care into uh, a specialty behavioral health setting. Um, as we talk about kind of what the function is here, the function of primary care behavioral health is really to increase access, right, and to eliminate barriers. So primary care behavioral health, the consultation model, is we have somebody here right now that can see you at the moment that you need care. Um, so it, that's one of kind of the strengths of the primary care behavioral health model. Um, the function of uh, collaborative care is really to work on managing a specific disease state, using a registry, and really kind of have an operationalized process around that. Behavioral health homes uh, is really about um, removing barriers for folks that have a mental health condition that are already engaged in a behavioral health site to them getting medical care and getting a really good um, collaborative effort around medical behavioral care in a behavioral health setting. Um, and so the idea there is to increase, to decrease the barriers to medical care that sometimes can seem daunting for those individuals who already have kind of a, a behavioral health condition or already engaged in a behavioral health uh, setting. Um, and, and also that a lot of times can be paired with some really effective case management strategies for those patients that need a little bit higher level of care. So again, I think we've, we've gone through the methods here, and again, this is more of the content heavy stuff before we talk about these a little bit more in a discussion format. Um, again, primary care behavioral, brief visits, consults, we've already gone through this. Um, collaborative care is really around psychiatry consultation, and then you know behavioral homes, again, primary care, co-located mental health. So the folks, I think you can kind of read through the rest of this slide. I think if we skip down to the goals part, the goal of primary care behavioral health is to increase, to enhance um, the patient-centered medical home. So when you have consultation and you have a really good integrated model, the goal of that model, not only to work through and give patients access to care, is to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of primary care as it was designed to be created. Uh, I work in an FQHC. We have to treat a whole host of issues that come in, and if we do a better job of integrating care, we're able to, to make sure that the medical home functions more effectively. That is really the, the benefit of that there. Um, for collaborative care, the goal is to improve the outcomes on a specific targeted condition, right? Behavioral health homes, um, one of the things that we see in the research is folks with um, behavioral health conditions die at a much earlier rate. There's a lot of issues with um, comorbid medical conditions. It just, it's just the way it happens. So the idea is really to improve, to enhance um, care around the physical comorbidities that exist with behavioral health concerns. Um, so that's kind of the function and the goal of doing that. If we do a better job of integrating behavioral, or excuse me, medical care into behavioral health homes, um, we're going to do a better job of treating the comorbid medical issues that come along with behavioral health concerns. Okay, I'm going to pause really quick. Does anybody have any questions about these models before I move on? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, good question. So the primary care behavioral health model is really focused on brief visits with the patient that happen at the moment of care. So a primary care provider identifies a patient and says, I've got this patient right now who is going through grief or divorce or loss or, you know, or depression. And the behavioral health consultant comes into the room. They have a very open schedule. They see the patient, brief visit, and then they consult the PCP they're right there at the point of care about what's going on with the patient. So the medical and behavioral plan is coordinated at the point of care so that the patient leaves with a coordinated care plan before they even walk out the door. A lot of times the way that that's helpful too is if there's a medication um, concern that needs to happen, like let's say they're not responding well to a medication or they might need a medication, 
the, the behavioral health consultant can come back out, talk to the primary care provider, and then there could be a dosage change or an addition of a medication so that there's a coordination and a consultation with the primary care provider. Does that make sense? Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the qualifications of the behavioral health provider, so we have in our system, we have psychologists, um, we have uh, licensed mental health counselors, LMHCs, um, in, um, which can comprise of licensed independent uh, clinical social workers. Um, it can also be comprised of um, licensed marriage and family therapists. So it really, it, it spreads the gamut. We have a mix. We, we do have, we started with some psychologists and then we've also integrated a lot of master's level folks. It's been a really, um, Cool approach to kind of see all those disciplines come together. Right. Yeah, go for it. How about care managers? Are they a little bit of next level down? Are, you, are they part of this team or are they part of any of the ways in which you're deciding these? Yeah, good question. Um, so care managers are care managers are a integral part of collaborative care, right? That's how collaborative care works with care managers. For primary care behavioral health, we have a lot of care management that happens through our nursing team. And so the behavioral health consultants do a lot of work in care management through the nursing team, through the PCP. So it could be through the medical assistant and or the nursing team and nursing triage if that happens. Um, we do have, we do coordinate with the existing registries that are already there. So diabetes, um, other things that we're working on. And that happens at the point of kind of, it's not a separate registry, from let's say like collaborative care is kind of a separate registry. I think primary care is behavioral health is again focused on helping the medical home in general. So we, we kind of capitalize what's already there and then integrate into that process. So the care managers in the collaborative care model spend, I would assume, the majority of their time working on registry. Registry contact. Um, contact and engaging with people around those registries. So, so it can it can happen a couple different ways. Um, really, yeah, I think that this is a really uh, good thing to bring up. The care managers can do both care coordination and and following up and following MHIDs or the registry, or they can and a lot of times they will see the patients. So they kind of serve both of those roles within collaborative care. I'm not an expert in collaborative care. We have done it. Uh, we did do it for a year, um, but it, they kind of serve that dually some. Collaborative care models focus, they have two different people, one that does a, the more of the registry work and one that does more of the um, kind of the actual clinical care and some people combine that role. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. I think it's helpful to just to kind of have an idea about the models themselves before we start talking about funding and other things. All right, so let's just let's just get into kind of the key features and evidence base that we're working from today. I initially like had this slide with a bunch of studies and citations and I was like these guys are going to glaze over. So what I decided to do was take the apples, oranges, and grapes approach like at 11.30 last night and redo this slide completely. Uh, so here's what you need to know. This is, these are the key takeaways. Number one, if you think about access, there's a lot of really good evidence for primary care behavioral health increasing access. It makes sense, right? If somebody needs care and you provide it right there, it increases access. Increases access. I can tell you from our standpoint, um, we one of our behavioral health consultants sees about 1,200 to 1,500 patients in a year. That's a lot of patients. That's a lot of access. Um, so there's a lot of evidence around that. Um, I would say for, for collaborative care on that side, um, Collaborative care does a somewhat better job of increasing access, but the goal of collaborative care is, that, again, remember it's not a horizontal integration, it's a vertical integration. So it increases access for that target population, but not for everybody as a whole, if that makes sense. So it somewhat increases access for your target population, but for those that fall outside of your target population, it doesn't really increase access. So I, I put a somewhat up there, if that makes sense. Behavioral health homes, on the other hand, do a really good job of increasing access for medical care for patients that have behavioral health concerns. So there is a lot of evidence to show that, if that makes sense. Um, for the outcomes uh, we see in primary care behavioral health, there's a whole kind of broad um, set, set of outcomes that come in primary care behavioral health. And again, without going um, into like crazy like study mode meta-analysis, I can tell you 
Um, it can help depression, it can help decrease anxiety. Um, we've had some recent studies come out with primary care behavioral health that have uh, decreased ED utilization, which is really awesome. Um, I think the big thing that we're starting to see now come through is the indirect, um, the, the studies that show how uh, primary care behavioral health and the consultation model can actually increase the efficiency of the patient-centered medical home. And what that does is actually help providers get in to see more patients and be more effective and more on time, if that makes sense. Um, they don't have to spend 35, 40 minutes when they get bogged down. They can actually stay on time and be more efficient and see more patients. So we do have some evidence to show that. Yeah? So that's a really good question. I think the most vulnerable, so we have, depending upon our clinic, we have outreach folks that are in the community trying to engage folks and get them into primary care. We have folks that are, that are lay folks that we employ that um, go out into the communities who kind of like a, kind of like a community health worker, it depends on kind of the clinic and the area, but they're working with people who have benefits but are unengaged. Yes, so it depends on the clinic based upon kind of the resources that we have, um, but it's a really it's a really needed kind of exercise. Um, I think th there's a, a couple other strategies, and I, I didn't mention this in anywhere in the presentation, but I think community awareness around behavioral health concerns. I'm, I'm speaking about behavioral health. Um, there's a lot of programs around mental health first aid that are trying to mental health first aid is really focused on helping increase the general awareness. Of behavioral health concerns and treat and teaching folks, lay folks, just kind of how to recognize and help people engage in the system. So I think it's it's a um, there's kind of the, the need to engage folks behaviorally, and then there's just the need to engage folks in general. And we kind of work on the general side, and we've also done mental health first aid to engage folks behaviorally, and hopefully get that word out and the destigmatizing message out to the community. Actually, I don't. I don't have any data uh, at at this point to share about that. But um, I think it's something that we need to look at going forward. I think it's something that we need to look at as a as a system. And I'm sure that at the ACH level, it's going to be interesting to, to see how the trends of people who have coverage and who are engaged with providers changes over time through this transformation process. Um, but we don't have that data internally yet. Um, I know we have some data in Oregon. Um, but I don't have it with me right now, but I, I know that we're we're looking at that. Yeah. Um, any other questions before I move on? Okay. Um, I'll just I'll I'll mow through this slide and then we'll we'll get into some a little bit more of the discussion too. Um, so uh, I can't remember where I was at. So we're on collaborative care. The outcomes for collaborative care are 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 really good for the targeted disease state that they're studying. So. Um, there's books on this. Um, there's a book on collaborative care that shows it can work for this condition, that condition, this. And I really like some of the emerging evidence that's coming out for MAT. Uh, I think it's a really good construct for how much care management, case management, and registry management that needs to happen, especially around substance use disorders. That's a, po a particularly vulnerable population that needs a little bit more of a wrap around care management, case management approach. And I, I'm just I'm advocating for that right here because I think that that's a really important way to think about that. Yeah. So it sounds like summary care behavioral health is more along the lines of what I would call the continuum of morale to moderate. And does collaborative care cover that, or is collaborative care more moderate or moderate to severe? So I think that's a little bit of a misnomer, and I and I I think when we and and Wes's question was. Primary care behavioral health is a little bit more mild moderate. I think the challenge that we have in primary care is um, we don't, we can't ever really get patients to go. Uh, patients are going to decide where they want to seek care, if I can say that. Um, so there's a lot of patients that we see in primary care that would probably benefit from a higher level of care, a behavioral health home, or even a, a collaborative care model. Um, but that, that they're more comfortable seeing people in primary care. So what do we do with that? Well, we see, so primary care behavioral health in our program, we designate about 10% um, of the kind of total patient population that we see, that we see pretty regularly. And that means like every time they come in. Um, and, or we'll see them in between their PCP visits because that's the only way we can engage them. And we need to respect the patients that will engage where they're most comfortable. 
And then how do we engage them with, with psychiatry? We have, in Washington, we have, we're working more, we have a, a psychiatrist that we just hired that integrates into the medical setting that helps us with that. And then the other thing that's been really, really helpful is e-consultation. So something that, that I wanted to share with, with all of you is um, sometimes we have patients who are engaged with the primary care provider and, and a lot of times this happens on the language and cultural front where they have a primary care provider that speaks Spanish and culturally kind of is a nice fit. Trying to get them to see a psychiatrist who's not that is really difficult. So we listened to our patients and we said, you already have this relationship. Let's go ahead and work with our e-consultation folks, get some recommendations, and then you can keep the relationship you already have with your primary care provider and provide that care. So there's, there's some benefits there that we're starting to think about technology-wise to bring access to care and also think about delivering that care in a patient-centered way. So we found, we found that to be really beneficial, particularly for um, folks that were already engaged with a primary care provider that culturally and, and just relationally was a good fit. Um, so back to your question, Wes. It's, it's about where the patient, it's finding ways to get creative where the patient feels more com most comfortable engaging and then kind of working with our service structure to meet the needs of the unique needs of the patients. And e-consult's one way to do that, integrating psychiatry, because primary care is going to see all, um, and you know, we have to find a way to, to meet those needs. Um, so you could say that we probably do the best job with the mild monitor, but we still have to find a way to, to meet the more significant mental health needs. And if we can engage them and motivate them and get them into the higher level of needs care, then that's great. If we can't, then we gotta get creative. So, any other questions? Okay, cool. I wanna, yeah, 10 minutes left? Perfect, all right, I'll, uh, I'll work through this. So, what you really need to know, um, I think through all of these, um, behavioral health homes, the outcomes, physical health outcomes are great. They've done a really good job. Um, they, uh, behavioral health homes have done a great job at decreasing levels of mortality for higher, um, higher needs uh, or patients with behavioral health concerns, which is, I want to, I want to reiterate, that's a lot of us. Um, and then uh, cost savings in primary care behavioral health, you see a little bit more indirect savings um, than direct. Uh, collaborative care direct, and then for behavioral phones, you see direct and indirect savings. Um, all of them have shown evidence around patient satisfaction, all of them also shown evidence around uh, provider satisfaction. That's what you need to know. All right, uh, okay, so let's get into a little bit more of the test style. So uh, you always get this, this idea of what integration works best. Um, and the, question, the, the way I answer that question is, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, they're all fruit, right? They're all apples, oranges, and grapes. So each one of them does a really good job at solving a different problem. Um, so you have to ask yourself, and I've said this at a, at a previous discussion, but I, I think it's important to hammer this home, is what problem are you trying to solve? Um, so getting to the finish line here is about what, what, what is the particular problem you're trying to address? For us, in our organization, it was access. So we needed to get creative, and we, we've rallied around primary care behavioral health, because we have a lot of folks that aren't, weren't getting care, and we also treat a lot of uh, folks that don't have insurance at all. Um, so we had to get creative. Um, the other way we've gotten creative around access is we just started a, a tele-VHC program about six months ago where we serve our small remote clinics um, that have one or two providers, because the challenge is, well, how do you get people access and how do you keep a full-time behavioral health consultant busy when there's only one or two providers? And the answer to that is, you have them serve multiple clinics simultaneously. And so what we do is we have one behavioral health provider work in a remote clinic, and then they see those patients live, and then they tell it into another clinic. We have iPads that wheel in on stands, and we provide telemedicine on the spot, on demand for patients in a remote clinic. So now we're serving four or five providers simultaneously in a way, in a, in a creative way. So again, get creative, think about the problems you're trying to solve, and adapt your model accordingly. So. There's, the answer then is which type of integration is best. It depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Because I think I've shown this before. If you don't have a problem that you're trying to solve and just start creating workflows, it looks like that. And you don't want to do that. Okay, don't do that. I actually like did that one day and I was like, what am I doing? 
Okay, so what about combining integration models? Um, so combining integration models is okay as long as the models and the method of which you're combining them make sense. All right, so um, sometimes people will create co-located care and primary care behavioral health so they can refer it to their own kind of specialty mental health system. I think that's great. Um, so think about how the models work with each other. I'm going to tell you a quick failure that we had because we didn't think about how the models would coordinate. We tried to have a collaborative care for depression and we had a primary care behavioral health um, and we thought we were going to get people from primary care behavioral health into the collaborative care model. The problem is, is depression wasn't the need that we actually needed to get patients in and seen for. So it was like it didn't really fit. The, the model and the patients that came up bubbled up to the surface that needed the most care and, and the, the issues that were they were faced with wasn't aligned with the collaborative care model that we had, right? And then you have a whole bunch of diverse issues that you find in primary care that need attention, but you have a disease-specific uh, model where you're only treating one disease. So that wasn't a good fit, and we learned from that. Not saying that collaborative care is bad, it just didn't, the way we coordinated that approach was not, it didn't work out. So if there's a lesson to be learned, think about how you coordinate your models of care as probably more important than the models themselves if you're going to do, um, you know, two or more models. And I think the other thing that's important is, if you haven't gotten this already, the approach is more important than the models. Adapt your approach to the needs that you have and need in your organization. Okay, this is like my second to last slide, or this is my last slide. So what about funding? Uh, I'll end with this. Um, here's what we do in terms of funding. Um, right now we're getting fee-for-service reimbursement for behavioral health. Um, I'm really interested to see how IMC plays out. Um, I can't call it FIMC anymore because it's not cool, right? So it's IMC now, and um, IMC, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. I think yeah. Yeah. Integrated managed care. Integrated, right? Thank you. I'm calling it IMC for so long, I forgot what it meant. Uh, okay. So integrated managed care is um, is it we're trying to figure out how right the, the we're gonna integrate this funding from um, the behavioral health funding and the, the medical funding. The challenge that we have here is um, it's still the method in which it's paid. So we still get fee for service. Fee-for-service does not reward good quality clinical care. It rewards seeing patients. So in Oregon, we have uh, clinics, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, where we actually have per member per month contracts that we get the money up front, there's a little, and then we get uh, a better per member per month rate based upon how we're engaging subsets of the population. So for example, we've been doing depression management, we're now gonna be working towards SBIRT and how we're actually achieving SBIRT. If we do a good job of engaging with SBIRT and having behavioral health presence in that, we get a higher PMPM. What does that do? Well, then that translates to the metrics that are, we're responsible at the state for. So what we're actually doing is aligning the payment methods with the way that we're trying to accomplish the metrics so that people are financially um, rewarded for achieving the metrics that we already have to do. If we're going to get somewhere in Washington, and this is my plea, we have to change how we pay for behavioral health care. We have to be able to align the, the method in which we're paying for care with what we're striving to actually have people do. Um, and that's a challenge that IMC needs to have, that needs to happen at the IMC level. And I'm, I'm not sure how it's gonna play out, and I don't know what the course looks like, but it's a really important thought because what we've seen in Oregon is if you incentivize it, it gets done. So, all right, that's it. That's all I have. Any other questions before I go? Yeah, he's not lost anymore. He's got different options, right? So, all right, any other thoughts? All right, thank you.
um, is actually really creative. Um, I guess we spent some time with Lori, their director for the uh, behavioral health, and they are actually boots on the ground going out and not only just trying to get these housing or these homeless people into primary care, but they're also bringing out water, um, cooking for them, teaching them how to cook, and even if they can't get them into the clinic setting, they're helping them, right? We're getting them into the clinic setting. <laughs>
of homeless that they primarily guide off of uh, the point in time count. Last year, we don't have 2019 yet, but 2018, the point in time count, you know, counted of roughly 800 in Yakima County. Hutch says for every one you count, there's probably three that you miss. So we gauge that in uh, under Health and Human Services, the Bureau of Primary Health Care, the definition uh, also is a little bit broader, number one, and number two, it's a year-long count of unduplicated people. So last year, uh, you know, HUD's count was about 800, at Neighbor Health, our year-long count of unduplicated was about 3,200, so that sort of, you know, it kind of matches up. So it would not be unreasonable to say that in Yakima County there were roughly 3,000 to 3,500 homeless people under the definition of HHS. Ronnie? And those are the ones that are just presenting yesterday and not ones that haven't come in. Those were people that came into our system last year. So um, in 2004, when we started our Healthcare for the Homeless program, our, our impetus was on street outreach. We had a nurse, behavioral health specialist, an outreach worker and case manager. As part of the continuum of care, uh, which we were part of in 2004, the, the, in the community, we did a needs assessment to identify what the, the needs were of the homeless, what our homeless issues were. Um, and that's when we first applied for homeless funding. What we learned was, we thought as a community health center, if people needed health care, they would come to us. We were wrong. They were going to the emergency room. They knew we weren't a free clinic, um, and that we needed to do more to go out and find people that needed care. So our, our first project was to develop, to, uh, develop an outreach team that could go out to the river, into the alleys, uh, down on the Greenway, and we did that and we were successful. We had a successful team that were able to bring folks into care. And as a result of that, our providers came back to us and said, if you really want us to make a difference in improving the health of these folks, you need to help them find a place to live. So at the same time, in our community, we had a couple of things happen. One of our major uh, shelter and housing provider organizations dissolved. They owned five housing projects under the HUD McKinney uh, funding uh, another Hub McKinney provider decided they no longer wanted to provide housing under this project because it's, it's a money loser. If you don't have some way to subsidize it, you're going to lose money. And then we had a need for medical respite care that emerged. Um, as part of our uh, funding, we had a board member that every quarter goes out and meets with homeless individuals uh, in their environments and asks how we're doing, what services do you need, what should we do more of. And at his very first focus group, what he heard was, we need a place to be when we're sick. So we immediately had three charges from either our boards, our providers, or our consumers on things that we needed to do. The continuum asked us to assume uh, two of the housing projects because they were dedicated specifically for people with medically fragile needs. And so that was our first entree into the world of housing. So um, just as a point of perspective, these are, uh, this is kind of the trending of our uh, point in time count over the last several years. So what you can see here is our house population, and so these are folks that were in um, shelters, permanent supportive housing, or transitional housing, and those numbers were actually going down. And this is a reflection of what I mentioned earlier, that we actually have been losing a supportive housing options in Yakima County over the last several years. And at the same time, the number of our sh sheltered, unsheltered population is going up. And uh, if there are, every county in, in uh, the state has document recording fees that come into your communities where the, the communities decide on where they want to put their dollars. The last few years, almost all of our dollar, dollars in Yakima County have been going for emergency services. So there's been sort of a perfect storm of this explosion of, um, of unsheltered residents and, and the need for more shelter. So this uh, next two slides are, were put together by the director of our homeless network, and I just thought that they really described sort of what we've been going through the last few years. The first one up on the top is a little bit hard to read. Well, they're all a little hard to read, I guess. Uh, but it, it says, you know, what are the causes of homelessness? So you've got emergency crises, you've got healthcare crises, and you've got family crises. And that results in, you know, a need for prevention services, rapid rehousing, and, and 
to, to get to safe and stable housing. So rapid rehousing, if you're not familiar with that term, it's really uh, the concept that when somebody becomes homeless, you want to meet them, provide the least amount of services possible to get them back into affordable, safe, affordable housing. So find out what they need, find out the least amount of services you can provide to help them get on their feet, get them into housing, so that the rapid turnaround back into housing services. Um, and so you've got, and so in the bottom box, you've got prevention, you've got, uh, you've got some shelter because you need some short-term shelter, and then you've got housing options. But then you've got a few people that are still left in the emergency system. And why are they still outside? Well, some of them have safety and mental health issues. Some of them um, have been sanctioned. They, they've done something they, that they are not allowed to go back into the shelter. And then there are capacity issues. Maybe you don't have enough beds in the shelter. So then what happens is that you've got still have, you have fewer prevention dollars, you have fewer supportive housing dollars, so you have a need for more shelter, and on and on and on. And this is, this is what has happened to us the last few years in Yakima County, is that we're looking at building more shelters, more, uh, more um, short-term solutions, and we still have uh, less capacity for permanent supportive housing. So in 2011, um, uh, our continuum of care, our homeless network, we had devolved, developed some models around some shared standards of learning for um, housing and health care. And we were named actually a promising practice by the Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation by Health and Human Services. The organizations on the left, I think most of which I've already named, but Triumph Treatment Services, the YWCA, their domestic violence program, uh, the Yakima Housing Authority is a huge partner of ours. We actually master lease a lot of our um, housing units from them. Uh, Building Changes and the Washington Families Fund uh, has been a very large partner of ours, county government, and then again, private landlords. As Patrick talked about, um, affordable housing is um, very hard to access. One of our solutions has been that we as an organization are actually the tenant we rent from the private landlord, so they know we're going to pay the rent, and then we sublease to our uh, homeless our homeless participants and oversee the program. Um, the reasons why we were chosen as a primary practice was that we do shared learnings around trauma-informed care, housing first, harm reduction, motivational interviewing. Our goal is to try to create a community standard um, of assessment and case management. We have assessment tools. Um, we share the HMIS system and data sharing um, across our organizations. If we have a client that is better served by Triumph Treatment or the YW, we, we do inter-case conferencing and we, have, we ask them to do the case management. They may be in our housing, but they may be case managing. So our health, our partnerships, so I, I've mentioned a lot of these, but um, most of these, organ as, as an organization, and I, I said this, or I should have said this if I didn't, but first and foremost, we are a community health center. And so everything that we do in our housing programs, we do with the aim of uh, trying to improve the health of our participants. So we are the coordinated entry access point in Yakima and Sunnyside. We do 90% of coordinated entry for Yakima County. Uh, we have a, a robust street outreach team that is going to try to find either participants that have not accessed health care or um, in some terms our providers consider our outreach team their human recall system. They need a patient, they haven't seen them, they'll, they'll tap the outreach team and say go find this patient, bring them in, I need them. Um, we also are the HEN provider of housing and essential needs, which is the short-term disability program in Washington State and, and the ABD, the age-blind and disabled population. We're also a health home provider. Um, and then uh, I mentioned how supportive housing and supportive employment under foundational community supports. We're one of the largest programs um, currently that's providing services. And, and I'll show you in a minute about how many of those were uh, our, our uh, homeless population. And then last year, we also received a grant, a five year grant under SAMHSA to work specifically with home, homeless individuals with substance use disorders and co-occurring disorders. And our goal there is to um, screen and um, motivate and help uh, clients choose that they want to seek treatment and then access stable housing, not necessarily in that order. But over on the right, and just the, the additional enabling support services that, we are, that our staff uh, work with our clients, and many of them need all of those services. 
So drink the Kool-Aid, housing and health care. Um, the Institute for Health Improvement um, 10 years ago or so came out with the triple aim. And so some of the things that we try to do is to tie out, tie certain outcomes to um, in our housing programs, the participants in our housing programs to the triple aim. So we'll go through a couple of these and show you what we did last year and how we measured up. In our supportive housing programs, because we are a healthcare organization in our community, uh, our niche is really serving the chronically homeless. We There are several supportive housing provo providers in Yakima. Um, many serve families, many serve youth. We serve some families, we serve some youth, but really our niche is really serving the chronically homeless, the folks that have been on the street a really long time. Under HUD's definition, if you're not familiar, a chronically homeless individual is someone who has lived on the street at least a year or four times in the last three years that add up to at least one year and they have to have a chronic disability. So um, this, these are our criteria. So people who are medically fragile uh, as determined by the prison scores or health home eligibility, they do need to be capable of ADLs. And then um, if they have diagnoses of mental illness, SUD or co-occurring disorders. And then additionally, because we do have additional health information about them, if we have staff knowledge or provider knowledge of additional com uh, complications, we take those into consideration as well. Under our medical respite program, these are the um, criteria that we have for medical respite care. This is a short term, it's not housing, it's really short term stay for people that if they could recuperate, if they had a home they could recuperate in, they would go home, but they don't. And so in our medical, in our respite program, um, the, it's an acute condition that can be either um, improved or stabilized while they're in respite. It's overseen by a nurse and a case manager, and then the behavioral health specialist is brought in as needed. And um, it, these are non-licensed facilities, and so they, patients do need to be able to administer their own medications. Right. Yeah, I'll get, I'll let me get to that slide in a second. I, I'll show you a breakdown on that. That's okay. One of the things I should mention is that um, because we we are we are cognizant of when we exit the respite program, we want to we don't want to eliminate somebody from being eligible for other programs. So it's defined as an emergency uh, housing, which means our standard is 30 days. There are lots of exceptions, and I'll talk about that in a second. I'll talk about that now. <laughs> so, so last year we had 72 individuals who stayed in our respite program for a total of 14, uh, 1,418 days. Uh, average was 19.7. I can tell you across the country, there are about 90 medical respite programs across the country. They, they look, they're, they're um, no two look alike. Uh, but the average is about 25 days across the country for medical respite. But we've had folks in there for anywhere from three days to the longest was 90 days last year. Um, they are, when they, um, when they come into respite, uh, last year, uh, the majority of them came to respite from one of our primary care providers, meaning they avoided going to the hospital at all initially. Uh, the other 40% came from the hospital discharge workers, and so our goal there was to prevent readmission to the hospital. Um, so when they, the first thing we do is to connect them to the primary care provider, and so we don't discharge them until the primary care provider says they're stable to be discharged. So you can see here that um, patients, we saw everybody from conditions like flu, pneumonia, bronchitis, gunshot wounds, abscesses, um, so there's quite a wide variety. We also had um, several that were referred by the primary care providers for our MAT program. So their first couple weeks while they were going through the induction period, they, the providers wanted them to have a safe place uh, for those first couple of weeks of MAT. A little challenging because as our MAT program is growing, we're going to have more capacity issues. So we're trying to figure out how we can increase our respite beds with that. Last year, we saw 123 people in uh, housing. Average length of stay was about a year and a half. 
in the housing program, 73% of them left us for other permanent housing. That's a success story. 6% died. 20% uh, returned to homeless, probably because they were evicted for doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And I will say, in our program, it takes a lot to get kicked out of our programs. So they did something really bad. So, Rhonda, that, I don't know if you want to call it recidivism, but that 20%, have you compared that to a, a peer group to know if that's a problem as well? Well I, well, I know the state would like it to have to be, um, uh, to have, as, I think 85% of it is the goal in the state to return to permanent housing. So, uh, but I honestly, I don't think anybody's meeting that because of the availability of housing. So we're not at what the state's goal is, but I don't know that anybody is. In our medical respite program, again, our goal here is to treat those that are, that is to treat an illness. <laughs> so 20% left to uh, permanent supportive housing, 3% died, 70% returned to homelessness. So if we kept everybody until we found a place for them to live, we wouldn't have any access in respite. So these are very different results. So our, our respite program and our model, you know, some respite programs look like full-blown nursing homes. Some look like full-blown skilled nursing. Um, ours is very different. Uh, our respite staff, our, our respite program is located about a block away from um, our healthcare for the homeless clinic. So our respite staff work very closely with our primary care staff in the, in the neighboring clinic. So. Um, the, the, neighbor, the uh, clinic has the nurse practitioner, the dentist, the navigators, the, the care coordinators, and then the supportive housing staff. Uh, the respite staff are there primarily to oversee, to do the daily checks, um, to uh, get them to their specialty referral. They do the transition and care reconciliation, the med reconciliation, and then uh, oversee the care plan from the primary care provider or the hospital discharge worker. Okay, so in terms of the housing piece, um, we have now just about done it all. We inherited housing, we bought some housing, we leased master leased some housing, and then our most recent project that opened last week, um, we built and rehabbed. And our developer was the Office of Rural and Farm Worker Housing, which is located in Yakima. It's a statewide organization, but they help people all over the state. The director is a, um, a man named Marty Miller. And I was at a hearing a couple of weeks ago around H2 work, H2A worker housing. And Marty was one of the presenters and he said in his comments, he said, you know, everybody loves our organization until dot, dot, dot. And the until was until we cite a project. You know, everybody wants, everybody thinks it's a great idea until they say you're gonna put it where? <laughs> so that, that was certainly our experience. So we, um, as the Homeless Network, uh, in 2012, had identified a need for a permanent year-round transitional shelter. And um, so through a year-long process, and this was actually a map de uh, developed by ORG for the Office of Rural and Farm Worker Housing, said we need to make sure that it's located in a community, in a neighborhood where people, the participants, can get access to the services that they need. And so this was sort of a diagram of the, there were three facilities in, the, in town that, um, that were available, buildings that could be rehabbed that they thought reasonably and cost effectively could be rehabbed. And so they looked at where were the services located that the participants and the residents would need and where were the logical um, locations. So the logical location was a, a former uh, IGA superstore that was built in the 1940s. It was called Roy's Market, if you are from Yakima, if you're familiar with it. Uh, that just fit the bill. And all of these services, food and health and hygiene and community outreach and legal services and veteran services and security, and it's right, right across from the bus line, uh, was the perfect location. So this was done back in 2013. So there were, there were a lot of hearings and neighborhood meetings and. Uh, a little bit of legal costs involved, uh, but last week we opened the RDH Center and it, um, you can see the before and after pictures. Uh, 22 units, uh, it will house 30, up to 37 individuals, six of those dedicated for families and three dedicated for veterans. But this was a true community project um, 
that, uh, and I, I need to back up. Originally, Triumph Treatment Services the, um, was the lead, pro the lead on this project, and about a year into it, decided that their strategic priorities were going a different way, and so they asked our organization if we would take the lead on it. We were in the supportive role. Up until that time, we were going to be providing the health services, um, but then they asked us if we would take over the operations piece, which we did. Um, and so we moved, started moving our first uh, group in on Friday, and this week they're starting to fill up the units as well. And so we have five dwelling units, and so a dwelling unit is, you know, basically like five little houses inside one building. So each one of these, and, and they are actually different colors, you can't really see it here, but each dwelling unit, every, every person has their own individual unit of living. And then they, uh, and then they share a kitchen and a bathroom for each, each of the pods. Uh, so they have a laundromat, there's a, there's a resident manager, and then there are lots of services. At a minimum of two of our case managers are there every day, seven days a week. The resident manager is there 24-7, um, and then partner organizations also come in uh, where the little, those little sunflower-like things are, are tables, and that's the family room where visitors and other service providers can come in as well and meet with their clients. Okay, so back to the pool aid and how we did last year in terms of trying to um, improve the health outcomes of the of the participants that we're working with in healthcare. So, as a housing provider, we participate in the HMIS system or the Homeless Management Information System. And as a community health center, all community health centers uh, report uh, to the federal government what's called the Universal Data System or the UDS system. There are six, seven hundred quality measures that we report on every year. One of the things that we do is we actually put our HMIS client number into our electronic health record system so that we can see how our HMIS clients or homeless clients measure up against our general population. So back to the, the triple aim uh, measures. So the first thing we're looking at is health coverage. And so the box on the left, Universal is representative of our 24,000 unduplicated clients that we saw last year. Uh, and then the other bars are, it's universal, our general homeless population of the 3,200 PSH or our permanent supportive housing clients, which was the 173 clients or the, that we saw last year. And then respite clients we, were the 72 clients. So that we're comparing our special populations to say, are we, you know, how are we at these, these vulnerable populations comparing them to our general community health center population. So for health coverage, because we know if you don't have coverage, that's a barrier to care. Um, with our permanent supportive housing and respite clients, we did pretty well compared to our general populations, as you can see in terms of accessing health coverage. And then on the right, we're looking at the total visits per user. So our universal population was 3.9 visits per user. Uh, compared to our general homeless population with 5.1 visits per user, in permanent supportive housing, 35 visit, visits per user, and in our respite program, it's 41. So our permanent supportive housing, that's all about case management. Um, our case managers see our clients, on our participants on a regular basis. They get them in for care when they need it, get them wherever else they need to be seen. And that's over a year's period of time. Remember, these folks were with us a year and a half on average. In our respite program, it's a much more concentrated period of time, but they see them a lot. And oftentimes, it's many disciplines. It could be a doctor, a dentist, a social worker, or a counselor, um, as well as the nurse. And then this is just looking at the medical visit, so an actual visit with a primary care provider. And here it shows that uh, with our general population, it was an average of 2.2 visits per, um, per, per patient. Our general homeless population was a little higher at two and a half. Our patients in supportive housing, 6.37 visits. This kind of makes sense because we're serving the chronically homeless. They have high, more medical needs. And so we saw them, uh, they had more medical visits. And again, in respite care, 8.58. Um, medical visits per user. Okay, uh, uh, chronic disease measures. So here we're looking at diabetes and hypertension, and these are our two top two, two of our top diagnoses in the organization. Uh, I think so we had 2,000 diabetics last year, Michelle. So uh, in our general population. So at the end of the year, 
in our supportive housing uh, programs, 92% of our diabetics had controlled um, diabetes, meaning HbA1c's less than 9. Um, in our hypertension, we had about 50% of our supportive housing. This, these are not real meaningful for a respite population because they're in respite for such a short period of time. It's hard to really influence um, diabetes and hypertension in, in the respite program. <clears throat> And then flu vaccines. Last year was a hard year to give flu shots. I heard Dr. Pedrosa say this to our board yesterday, so I don't know if we know why, but it was just a hard year. People were not real, real um, willing to get their flu vaccines last year, except for in our respite program. We did great. So I think that's, a, that's a tri uh, credit to our nurse that oversees the respite program. She, she, her motivational interviewing skills were on top of being last year. Well, that's true. And then talking about mental health, um, in our homeless population, 73% of our patients had at least one mental health diagnosis. In our general population, at least 30%. So, you know, I, I really um, applaud Brian's comments is that you really, you know, you, you need to meet the patients where they're at and provide the service where they're at and what they're most comfortable with. We, we use all of the models he described, and it's a matter of which one fits the patient best. Okay, I think I think I'm good. <laughs> so this is a shared record. Um, our homeless and housing and outreach team. Uh, I'll share an integrated health record, and this is just an example of showing that that Dr. Pedrosa and her behavioral health staff and her care coordinator. This happens to be a, a, an MAT patient uh, record that's showing her diagnoses of uh, homeless and um, opioid dependence, and then what the outreach team is doing to help this patient get into care. And then foundational community supports. I mentioned that we're a provider last year. Um, this is who we saw about 123, I think, that we folks that we saw for supportive housing or supportive employment. 38% were literally homeless. 25% uh, were in supportive housing. Uh, many of them were hand clients as well. The qualifying reasons were um, two or more stays in adult residential care. They had high prison scores and they were homeless for supported employment. Uh, the reasons were there were mental health issues and they were dis uh, there was disruptive behavior. Those are the qualifying factors. In our respite care, um, this just kind of shows the cost effectiveness of respite. And we, one of the things we ask the hospital discharge workers when they go is, if you didn't have respite to refer your patients to, how much longer would you keep them in the hospital? Last year, they reported a total savings of 53 inpatient days, and this is what it equ e equated to. Um, again, when they left the hospital, this is, we, we use the Eddy system, 30 days after they leave us from respite, we use the Eddy system to look up and see if they return to a hospital within 30 days anywhere in the state of Washington. 30% did, 71% uh, did not. Um, quick story about Bob, uh, which was a 78-year-old man that was dropped off in front of our uh, resource center at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, we kept him in respite for 48 days. Uh, before that, he had been in, in inpatient for um, for 30 days. His bills were $37,000. He had eight visits to the ER. That was total $4,800 compared to our cost in respite, which was $5,300. We kept him until we were able to help him get into an assisted living facility, which is where he still lives. You've all heard. You probably heard the story of Million Dollar Murray. This was a um, a man in Reno who was lived on the streets for uh, 10 years. The police chief calculated that he was costing the city of Reno about $100,000 a year between EMS costs, police, um, the emergency room system, and the police chief finally said, let's help Murray find a place to live. So they put him into permanent supportive housing, attached a case manager to him, and then the cost went dramatically down. So every year we update this to say, what does it cost us to put one to keep one chronically homeless individual in permanent supportive housing, and for us last year it was $13,000. Um, about $7,600 for a one-bedroom apartment in Yakima. Case manager is about $5,600. Our ratio is one to 10 or one to 15, depending on the caseload. <clears throat> so, um, you know, according to the Chief O'Brien, it costs us a million dollars not to do something about Murray. So our, our take away is it costs a lot less to do something. <clears throat> 
my the final slide is we know a thing to do because we've seen a thing or two. Um, you know, the lessons that we've learned in our community are uh, participants may say no today and yes tomorrow about about how to improve uh, their own uh, health and stability. Trauma-informed care and harm reduction works, uh, but it takes more time to let the client lead the discussion and lead and lead the goals. Work versus disability benefits sometimes work wins. Uh, under support of the employment program, we have a couple of individuals who have been appealing their disability for years and last year under the employment program. Uh, we have at least two that their disability benefits came through and they said, no thanks, I like my job, I think I'll keep working. So those were successful. Um, so recovering clients are less likely to relapse when housed. We are finding that, that if we can help them get into supportive housing, and, and stabilize with their case manager that they uh, they can stay um, recovered. And then finally, families reunify successfully as housing stabilizes and health improves. Most of our, most all of our programs are housing first, yes. I'm just wondering because of the STD and um, what I understand on, in our Asking the question to our patients, 
what do you need? What works best for you? Do you want to come in at 6 a.m. or would you rather come in at 6 p.m.? You know, uh, we have providers that are working 410 just for having that extended access and extended access during certain times of the year because of you know, certain populations. Um, and then that cross-continuum of care coordination. So internally, how do we communicate? How do we talk? Um, our assistant PMO right now is, our, is, our, is our, an optometrist, and she is really trying to push that, you know, diabetic eye. Like, call me. I know I don't have access till forever from now, but call me and we'll get your patients in. You know, um, having that clear understanding, endocrinology, those things that we can really get our patients in, even if you don't see an opening on the schedule. So that's that internal care coordination. And then externally, who do we know and how can we communicate? so that we can get the best care as possible for our patients, even if we don't have it directly available. Um, so this is kind of a fundamental slide. Uh, this is something that we really use a lot in trying to explain to our providers and our care teams and any of our general staff that's really trying to understand what patient-centered medical home is and how practice transformation really goes into that. because. As we train and we do a practice transformation, we don't want to just say, this is what we're going to do. You know, everyone needs to understand from frontline staff to the providers, to all of our senior leadership, to the board of directors, they all need to understand the point behind it, right? And so the fundamentals are necessary, but it's really that reason behind. So when we look at it, the general ideas, actionable steps, cut and dry, and then we can go dive deep into each of these things and say, how do these pertain to you as a whole? How do these pertain to your service line or what you're going to be doing or your patient interaction? Um, and so this is just kind of a fundamental side of what we do and how we use it. Um, so this is our PCMH journey kind of as a whole, um, really, really high level. Um, a strategic initiative was identified by our board of directors and our senior leadership staff, and that was essentially just that. How do we fully implement and utilize PCMH? How do we make sure that we're not just saying we're patient-centered medical recognized, but we're really doing it? We can say that. We can see the results in our patient care. We can see the results in who we are and how we're treating our patients. Um, we do have recognized clinics and recognized providers, but if we really look at it and we look at PCMH as a whole, can we say fully and equivocally that they are PCMH and they understand the point of PCMH and all of those things? And so really trying to put that baseline on that, that knowledge base on them so that they feel like they're making a difference because that's the point. The point is not just to get the recognition. The point is really just to have them feel it so that our patients feel it. Patients want to feel like they're being taken care of. Like they're the center of everything. That's patient-centered, right? Patient-centered medical home. Everyone wants to feel like you're the center of your provider's world. Um, Value-based payment quality initiatives really tying that into it. Um, you know, making sure that we can get the payments for the quality work that we're doing. How do we tie it in? How do we identify? Do we have enough information on it? And how do we best, you know, work our workflows and explain to our providers that that's, this is not just about money, but it is kind of because we're still going to get the money. So you know, it's a it's, it's a bonus. Bonus either way. Um, that integration of ancillary services. So that's really where Richard comes in, integrating our pharmacy, dental, endocrinology, optical, all within house, so that we can really have that care coordination between them. It's a simple phone call away or a task. Everything is in. They can review notes within our EMR system. Those things that are really available um, and the resources to have for our patients. And then um, really identifying that opportunity for that bi-directional integration for physical and behavioral health. Um, that's really something that's been a big focus. Um, it's something that we've gone back and forth with, but it's really something, as Dr. Gonzalez just walked up, is, um, <laughs> is a huge proponent of it and, um, and, and a huge focus of what we'll be doing from 2019 on. So, um, next slide. One of the major things that we did in our core group, which is listed in the second and bottom, um, is really identifying a, a vision statement for practice transformation. So this goes beyond our vision statement for Tri-Cities Community Health. This is specifically for um, practice transformation. And it's just that TCCH is the clinic of choice for our patients and staff to serve our community. So what we're looking at is that this is their option, right? This is, this is why we're centrally located. This is where we're at towards the patients. 
and that's the goal to get them in to show them that we are there because that's where we want to be it's all about them patient centered um so on that note richard is going to go over some milestones that we've been going uh, richard is our director of pharmacy and he's going to essentially um tell tell everyone what we've been doing with our milestones this year I move a lot. I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. Um. So basically, what we had tried to do in the pharmacy is look at okay, how are we going to meet this these uh, criteria? How are we going to meet these goals? And then, how is pharmacy going to help the clinic impact that? Um, one of the things as we looked at identification referrals of unimpaneled patients and anybody who's not our patient, clinic patient, but comes to us is an unimpaneled patient. So our goal there is to try and get those patients to come to the clinic. And it may be that they utilize just one or more of our services and we want to get them in and become their PCP. So we may see them as a dental patient, which we see them as in pharmacy because we get their prescription. And if they are not uh, set up with a provider, we use that as an opportunity. So pharmacy is a referral source. And really any of your departments are a referral source. They just have to know that they are. <laughs> and, and we have to tell them. <laughs> uh, risk stratification. Um, we use Pioneer RX as our software, and it actually has a, a neat tool where we can actually um, enroll patients in med synchronization. And it has a, um, a tool that identifies high-risk patients. And that's based on their uh, the cost, their diagnoses, their number of medications, and several other factors. So we use that, and then we just drill down on that. So we can get a pharmacy patient in or you know a clinic patient in and it tells you right there this is somebody that you need to make sure that becomes in panel and that you are synchronizing their medication so that they're adherent um, we have established standards of um, care and uh, we are now working on moving those into where we integrate the behavioral health piece and i have one example of the one that we've done so far in conjunction with uh, the behavioral health department. We also have protocols that we use. We have refill pharmacists. And so um, that takes a lot of burden off of our providers um, set up on that protocol and the CDTAs that we use. And uh, it allows us to fill a lot more prescriptions and we make more money. And we also keep our patients compliant because we're keeping on top of that. The um, bi-directional integration, um, the, um, and I'll, keep going. Okay, so I'll back up and talk about um, a couple other slides, but this is uh, what we uh, developed for uh, integrating behavioral health and diabetes. Um, a significant number of our patients um, are diabetic. Um, we have a large Hispanic population, and about 60% of our Hispanic population is diabetic or at risk for diabetes. Uh, we're currently working on a, um, a national, we have a national grant. Um, we're one of four or five sites nationally that where we're looking at pre-diabetes, and we're using that also to help ensure that these patients don't become diabetic. Um, this is a tool that we use where we identify what inputs that we have from different departments based on where a patient is at uh, with their A1C. And uh, one of the main thing that we've changed on this is that if you notice, behavioral health is included. For, um, for myself as a pharmacist, it's really interesting when somebody comes to the pharmacy with a um, medication for diabetes and they've just been diagnosed. Um, some people 
literally respond as if you told them that they had inoperable cancer. And so it's very traumatic. And uh, that's where behavioral health can really be helpful. The um, depression is a key problem with medication adherence because depressed people don't take their meds. And um, you have to really do a lot of education and you want to make sure that those people are engaged. Also, when people go from taking oral diabetic medications and they're going to need to go to injectable, um, there's a lot of needle fear. And so you really have to work with them on that. So um, that's, this is probably the most, um, other than cancer, I would say this is probably the most critical area where you have behavioral intervention. So that's why we started with that first. Um, can you back up to this one? Okay. Now part of what we have to do here is sell it to our own people. <laughs> um, and this was just the, on the sheet that we have, um, the main sheet, we have this listed the four object, the objectives. And basically, we're using this to assist the primary care providers in individualizing the care and goals for the adult patient with diabetes. And we're just using this, can I have the next slide too? Basically, this is just to preface the guidelines that we've laid out for the providers and to sell this to our own people as to why we want to do this and why this needs to be integrated. Um, we all have our own preconceived misconceptions about um, care and how you provide care. I know as a pharmacist, I have my pharmacy viewpoint. As a medical provider, they have their viewpoint. And to work collaboratively requires us to really shift that paradigm. And we have to get through that. And for me, as a manager of the pharmacy department, I have to educate my staff that that's why we're here and that we have to look beyond what we, beyond the lipstick count pour to look at how can I help this other provider provide care to this patient. Any questions? And no, these are just, um, I had just added these in in case I um, just to list those out, but uh, that's as far as we are so far. Basically, we can't really do any analysis of where we're at until we actually implement our process, and we're just starting to do that. These are some of the um, current standard of care that we have in place that we'll be modifying to include behavioral health. And these are the therapeutic um, collaborative drug therapy programs that we have in place. Now, oxone immunization, therapeutic interchange, medication management, and prenatal care. Richard? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what that collaborative uh, Collaborative is? practice, yeah. ther uh, collaborative drug therapy agreements. Um, basically, the, um, we have one pharmacist that works with the, our endocrinologist, and um, she actually has a, a collaborative practice agreement in place to where she can modify the, the drug therapy um, under guidelines that the endocrinologist has established so that she does that on her own. Uh, as far as our therapeutic interchange, um, we change drugs within certain classes. So, for example, right now, if you probably heard about Velsartan and Losartan um, being recalled. And so we'll move patients between those drugs as those drugs are available, but keep them in the same class at the same relative dose. Um, our medication management. Um, the, uh, it's mainly diabetes at this point in time with that. 
naloxone, we can uh, provide naloxone to patients on that CDTA through the pharmacy. We can write the, our own prescriptions for that. And of course, immunizations, which is um, pretty common throughout the state. And uh, we do have um, part of our use of 340B funds is we provide adult immunizations to patients that cannot afford it as well. Can you give an example of what you do under prenatal care? Um, under the prenatal care, if, if the um, a, a patient presents to us who's pregnant, then we can go ahead and provide prenatal vitamins and folic acid. And that's generally because um, they they have not had their appointment yet with their provider, and we can just offer that right away, and then they get established with their provider. Sure. You mentioned that. Uh, The, um, let me go back to that slide. Okay. Um, as, like I said, we're just preliminarily, we just are rolling that out. Um, currently, as far as what we utilize in the clinic, we're using the PHQ2 or PHQ9. And we're, um, Dr. Gonzalez is currently in the process of evaluating, you know, what they want to do as far as a standard or what we would use or, or several standards and then roll that out to, um, you know, whether we're going to go to a model of where we have a, a behavioral health um, person available in the clinic at the time, you know, whether that's going to be done, you know, by the MA, by the provider, you know, how we're going to do those, those assessments. Um, the, um, that's not, my area of expertise, so I don't, I don't know how they're going to, how they're planning to implement that. I just wonder if there was a relationship with the Yeah. A lot of the community health centers are using prepared tools. Right, right. That's one, that right. That's one that we're evaluating, yeah. It's PRA, T-A-R. Any other questions? Thank you. Station. As we're uh, in 
in construction this last year for our newly integrated clinic. So throughout this presentation, I want to honestly show you kind of our journey into integrated care. Great question. Yeah, that's where we drop line. So yeah, yeah. Uh, notice our integrated care lobby. This is our our great work on our quality lighting system. Um, what's what's actually interesting about this is that we we a lot of this construction is intentional. We had a classic single entry point desk. People came in, they were able to check in with their you know their counselor and then would go back. So uh, what we've done here is we've really created an opportunity to improve flow. So as we looked at what are some of the issues for patients that come into services, that we wanted to create a way in which everything was integrated. So behavioral health, primary care, SUD services, PAC services, crisis services, all the services that we provide in North Central are all accessed through our central reception desk area. So it gave us a way in which there was no stigma. Everybody comes in through the same point of access. So you're not going to a separate department. You're not being sent into a different area. Uh, you enter here, everybody processes in and out the same way. There's no difference. So it makes it much easier for us, but it also is intentional in reducing the stigma. I'm, I'm sure you're fam familiar with PCMH standards. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do was like look at what are the issues that we had in particular. And I'm going to break this up into kind of what we did with two separate regions. So talking about what we did in Greater Columbia and talking about what we did uh, aiming for North Central. Um, in North Central, we primarily serve crisis services, uh, behavioral health, SCD. We're the main behavioral health provider. Uh, as we started to look at this process, one of the things we wanted to do was look at how do we really provide improved access for our patients. And Brian's slide was great when it talked about behavioral health integration. You know, that's one of the things we're going to do here in Greater Columbia. We're going to target behavioral health integration and figure out how we can do it better. We're looking for partners and being able to work on it. But <clears throat> What we wanted to do in North Central was we really wanted to take on that collaborative care model. And the reason for that is that we have a high percentage of seriously mentally ill individuals. Uh, schizophrenia makes up 30% of our active patient population. Yeah, yeah, 30%, just schizophrenia. So that kind of tells you what our target population is for our initial PDSA, right? So our goal was to target this population, provide integrated care, create a registry system that we could track all the um, all our integrated care, our lab work, our diagnoses, our risk stratification, all built into a model that would then target this population. That's my lab. So, uh, this is really unique because we had never had a lab service before. So now all of a sudden we have an integrated lab service that we brought in. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the construction process. So this is what we looked at, North Central. We were able to have an identified primary care provider. Uh, we partnered with Columbia Valley Community Health. Um, they've been a great partner for us. Uh, one of the things we did is that we sat down and for almost 12 months worked out a contract on integrated services and what it would look like. Uh, we built the clinic, provisioned the clinic, and they leased the space from us. It's provided a great way for us to work together as we increase the amount of time that the provider is in the house, then they increase the lease payment. And it becomes a really efficient way for us to work together. Uh, one of the things 
that we've done as well is that we've created access to both of our electronic health records so we can see each other's records in parallel. Our staff are trained in their system. Our staff have all gone through orientation with CBCH. Um, so that way, they meet all the standards for JCO. Uh, we do all the scheduling. So it's been very helpful. Much different here. We have such a different population in Greater Columbia that we've really had to look at how we're integrating services in a much different way. Um, we have a high number of psychiatric providers in our facility up there. Uh, we went mid adopter in 2018. That really gives the ability to have that time to plan and implement uh, and work with CBCH on implementation. So this is my exam rooms, our exam hallways. So one area that I really want to focus on is quality and safety as we talk about integration. We partnered with the University of Washington to create a registry. Um, and what's unique about that is that we were able to look at the primary care diagnoses that we're, we were seeing, and we specifically targeted diabetes, heart disease, tobacco use as another area that we're addressing. We, we built our registry based upon the idea of risk stratification. We wanted to keep it easy so that we could stratify on three different levels. So we used the diagnosis, we used um, drug and alcohol use, smoking status, diabetes, heart disease, and we also implemented patient activation. Kendra, was there anything else that we incorporated? Uh, patient activation. So patient activation is a really essential piece of this. Um, we purchased the PAM, we used the coaching for activation, and it's been very helpful in like really identifying the patients. One of the interesting things that we came across is that as we looked at risk stratifying, that as we looked at the schizophrenic population, all high needs. So we had to look at how we could stratify even more and be able to really identify patients with high needs that really needed the higher intensity services because we've implemented an integrated care team that has case managers, therapists, nurse practitioners, primary care, MAs, as well as all of our additional behavioral health services. That's been a big, big challenge for us, but it's also been a great opportunity in like creating the system because one of the things we've done is that we took the AIMS tracker and then we, we built our own system into our AHO. So we now have an integrated whole person care data set that allows us the ability to track within our EHR risk stratification and our patient registry. I think our biggest challenge has really been identifying partners. That, that for us was like one of the best things that we did was identifying someone who had similar values to us. That their goals around working with the patient population wasn't just generating widgets. That they recognized that the patient population we we're working with is chronically mentally ill. And that the goal isn't that we're going to increase their lives 20, 30 years, but that we're going to increase the quality of their life. That the more that we can do that, the better. We strategically looked at hiring as a way of really moving forward our goals on integration. Uh, hiring Kendra was one of the best things we did. It gave us a defined person who could really focus on the healthcare transformation. That 
we then went out and really looked for early adopters within our employees and identified people that were passionate about change and about integration and then brought them in to then talk about what we could change in the system. We used consultants from Qualys, from the University of Washington, and GCACAs, to then really refine what we were looking for. We've utilized the PDSA cycle, Plan, Do, Study, Act, to then use that as our management tool to track change and progress. So, uh, another good example of that is when looking at our intake process and trying to figure out how do we improve our intake process. Averages two hours for behavioral health intake. We want to be able to decrease that so it's much more accessible. One of the things that is unique about Catholic Charities and especially about North Central is our high population of schizophrenics that we're serving. The more that we've used our data to be able to tell the stories of the services we provide has really had an impact. That it's one thing to talk about you know, 5,000, 10,000 services. I can talk about the widgets we generate. But then when we go to talk about the impact it has on patients, I can talk about a single individual and talk about how previous to their involvement in our integrated care program, previous to their involvement, they've been in and out of law enforcement contacts 14, 20 times. And then once we start showing their involvement with us, with the diversion program in our integrated primary care, all those contacts go away. So that's the one thing I would really encourage you to do is like, one, know your data, but also to be able to share data that really talks about the value of what you're creating. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So the one thing I hope to take away is that this is a journey. We had an opportunity to get a, a year-long head start up in North Central, and we're hoping to be in the same place a year from now with greater fun. today, if, um, you, my biggest takeaway from the, the integration of each one of these different specialties is access to care. Um, at this time, I'd like to see if there's any additional questions that anyone would have. Um, the practice navigators are here on site as well, and they are boots on the ground and they're in with the clinic. Like I said, most of the spaces here are very familiar to us, and we appreciate working with you and partnering with you. Um, so if you have any questions. Um, my question is to the folks that presented. I think um, what has been the opportunities that the ACH has presented in supporting those that are exemplars? So if you're sort of out in front, what has been the opportunity um, in the work that the ACH has has supported you you in? Actually, we have Lord here on site, and they can uh, give you some information on how the employers have been supported. So, nothing else with the questions then. Yeah. I can ask you. So. Well, so I guess that would be helpful. I think it would also be helpful to hear from the exemplars, um, because you know, just that idea of like, if you're out in front, how are you leveraging the work of the ACH to also continue to sort of propel you forward? I think it's also helpful to understand, but then I think it'd be great to hear from those that are learning from the exemplars too. Sam, can you, for those on the phone, can you repeat the question? Yes, the question is, how are the exemplar clinics, how are they uh, participating with the GCACH, and also how are they um, being able to assist these other clinics in their journey of PCMH, bidirectional integration, and other integrations of specialties? Mm -hmm. So for, for us, one of the values was that we had the strategic goals already set. We're going to do integrated services, your specific goal is that Catholic Charities is that it was helpful to have the external um, push from the ACH saying, hey, we 
want to see you do a panel, and it's here's these pieces. If we want to see you do these pieces, please email us. How to how do we have those structures? So they gave us the structure, the external structure that is really you know it's like an outline to say do these things, and that we use the internal our internal partners and our internal systems to then leverage that and really move the motor project forward. So a really good example is we have a, a system around notifying patients of available appointments, canceling appointments. Um, we've added to that by like adding a two-way email system, direct communication, and are expanding some pieces that provide uh, releases of information, all things to expand access to our patients. But it really was coming from the ACH that gave us that external structure and said, now look at this piece and you know, be able to report on when that's going and what progress you're making. So it's, the, the key is that it's been a journey and that they've like given us some outlines and said, okay, here's this, we want to see some progress by it. And that, that's been really helpful. Rhonda? Well, you took my word. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I didn't time has been really helpful for us because it, it is a process that we're and we're looking at the 2017 standards. I think Jenna can attest to the fact that we've had very robust conversations on what it is we want to work on next. And, and in the community health center, uh, the topic of empanelment top typically generates the most robust conversations in our organization um, in terms of um, you know what? What are we about? We're about access, and we're about continuity. And how do we how do we balance that? So our conversations in terms of what we're working on next, what's the biggest priority, what's first. Uh, so I think the timing that the ACA has brought the structure to us has been has been very helpful for us.
things that we want to do in the ACH to help us kind of start those things so that if we can find the money for the staff in here and we can put these in place and we can direct, redirect some of our other resources here and these two things together are going to help us move leverage everything that we need to leverage in order to move quality. So, I mean, it's great to be a mentor. We all like that gold star, right? But that doesn't mean we don't have room to grow and room to work. Um, and so that's kind of what this is helping us do, is helping us with what we already, we already have and do more. Sam? Well, how much additional training would you require to get your, your MA staff, your outreach staff, your care navigation staff, uh, up to speed, or is that still kind of a an existing process? And, and who's the ACH is funding that? The managed care organizations, the contracting are funding that. I'm a little confused about that. Who's paying for all that training? We are. <laughs> <laughs>
it's more than that. Thank you, Barbara. That's on our Thank you. Patient motivation trumps everything. Yes. Yes. And engagement is where they feel most comfortable. I think that's probably the most important thing that we get out of here. Thank you, Brian. Brian, so to piggyback off of what Barbara just said, my new position was more takes me back out on the street and engaging with clients at their homes or their places of being. So that means out on the street or wherever that might be. Um, the clients that I'm seeing most generally are the most extreme clients that won't see doctors, that stay reclusive, that won't trust anybody. I have to gain their trust. I have to gain their participation in getting them into um, and I really covet this position because it's very special. I get to be the vulnerable at their most vulnerable. <laughs> if that makes sense. If that makes sense. Um, and getting them just into their primary care. Yesterday I was with a woman who's delusional, extremely delusional. Um, she's been she's been posed to be vacated from her place. Uh, because of the fact that she is delusional and people live in her attic. And she has a whole slew of people that are not real. And in that, I have to engage her where she's at. I can't tell her that you're delusional. I can't tell her these people aren't there. I have to see her as her. Moving her to just get to her, her uh, primary care from in that place took me almost a month to get her to get the appointment, keep the appointment, and actually open the door to get her in there. She finally did that yesterday. The next step is to get her to see her psychiatrist. She hasn't seen her psychiatrist in over a year, but she's trusting the day to me Tuesday that I'm going to be there to go get her and take her to her appointment so that she can see her psychiatrist. People won't come to you unless you have somebody there to cancel them, walk them through the process, and trust. And that's the case over our thing is trust. How do we get people to trust us? And we're not there to send them to inpatient. We're not there to decline them from their house and uh, take away what they know is there. So meeting them where they're at, and this integration piece coming together and giving them the opportunity to see who they need to see when they need to see them and support them through it. That's the bigger thing. And I appreciate the Greater Columbia County Board of how in pulling all of us together in this leadership place and helping with those processes. Thank you. So before we uh, get going, we just want to highlight um, for next month, as you saw on the work plan, um, we'll have another learning collaborative, and the focus is going to be on EMS, emergency medical services, and their role in community paramedicine, uh, which is a, an important model where EMS providers uh, reach out into uh, patients' homes, they do care coordination on um, uh, education and other services. Um, we believe that this is really an important part of um, the natural community of care. So we will be bringing on board, or excuse me, we'll be bringing in speakers from some of our local EMS programs and, and possibly um, someone from another part of the state to talk about um, this very, very important subject. So we hope to see you then. Thank you for attending today. Please make sure that you sign in if you did not um, when you came into the meeting today so we can account for your presence. Thank you.